Hey, let's welcome to the Rob Newton Resource Hour my doctor, and he soon will be yours, I hope, and that's Dr. David Klein of the Stages of Life Institute in nearby Longwood. And doctor, today we'll talk about elective surgery. We hear about that, but what is elective surgery? Okay, well, really, there are two major types of surgery. There's an emergency over which you have little control. These are the sorts of things. You have a piece of bone hanging out. You know, it's a really a good idea to, to reduce that fracture, and they would call this an emergency surgery. If you're having a heart attack, having an emergency stent put in would be appropriate under many circumstances. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you know that you've got a hernia, or if you know that you have carpal tunnel, or if you know that you have a bunion, you're going to go ahead and have these things surgically corrected should you desire to do so at your earliest or your most convenient time. It happens to occur when you're at your healthiest. So what happens is you go in and you get medical clearance. This is where you go in and the doctor looks you over, listens to your heart and lungs, and makes a decision whether or not there's anything to keep you from having elective surgery. And even elective surgery, there are risks. Now, I was a, an anesthesiologist at one point in my career, and I guess technically I still am. And we were taught something, and that was there's no such thing as a simple anesthetic. There may be easy surgeries, and there may be routine surgeries, but anesthesia is where your risk generally uh, lies. People mm-hmm. sometimes don't do that well. So what happens is, is we need to make sure that you are at your healthiest before we go ahead and make whatever necessary physiological changes are going to occur in order to render you senseless or at least numb through the procedure. You come out having no memory of what went on, which is terribly important to most people, and then you go along your merry way. Well, unfortunately, these hospitalizations don't always go as smoothly as you think, and they never do exactly what you want them to do. Well, what am I talking about? Well, number one, you're going to go in and you have, you're going to have your bunion repaired. And they're going to tell you, the surgeon will be very honest when they say, well, it's a six-week recovery. But in truth, it's a year before you're going to feel right. It's a year before a year. you're going to walk right. It's going to be a full year before you're going to be yourself. So you have to make certain plans. There are certain things that you, that you have got to do before the surgery or you are going to find yourself up a certain creek without a paddle. And it works a little something like this. Okay, you're going to not walk so well. At the end of a two-hour you know, sitting session at work, your foot's going to swell up and you're going to wonder what to do. And this inevitably happens on a Thursday night or a Friday night when you're not going to be able to find competent help to give you an answer. Nor will you necessarily find somebody that's going to answer the phone whatsoever. So what you really need to do is you have to look at your recovery period, not so much in the surgical sense. For an anesthetic, it's a two-day recovery. If you're alive after two days, it's no longer a surgical complication. You're never going to see that anesthesiologist again, and nor should you, unless you have another surgery. The surgeon, on the other hand, is looking for infection. Peak incidence is going to be at three to four days. After that, the likelihood of infection drops off very, very substantially. But there are many other complications of of surgery that you need to watch for. We have many circumstances where you have sutures that come out on their own or that they dissolve on their own. So you may never even see the surgeon again. And these days, for as little as they're getting paid for routine surgery, it's a surprise they're doing it at all. So what do you have to do? Well, the first thing you should do is to find out what sorts of equipment you're going to need in order to survive. So in the case of a bunion, in the case of a knee surgery, you're going to need knee immobilizers, you're going to need crutches, you're going to need a cane, and you're going to need a walker. You might need one of these little knee scooters to get around. Guess what? You are not Superman, and the older you get, the longer it takes to heal. So one good rule of thumb is that if it takes six weeks to heal a fracture when you're 21, it's going to take 50 to 60% longer when you're 35. It's going to wow. take another 60% on top of that when you're 50. And when you're 80, it's going to take five, maybe six times longer. And the surgeon, surgeon may say, oh, that's nonsense. No, it isn't. It's absolute reality because your metabolism, uh, metabolism has diminished. Your health is not as it was. And guess what? Even when the skin mends. It never really gets much uh, past about 60 to 70% tensile strength. So people think just because the wound is closed, it's as it was before. 
Tensile strength in the skin never returns to normal, and the older you get, the uh, sk uh, thinner the skin becomes, wow. the thinner the muscle becomes, and the harder it is for the nerves to repair themselves. Well, what else is there? Well, we're looking at recovery periods, so you need to go out and find somebody who's had a similar surgery and ask them. One, how long did it really take you to get back to what you're doing? And two, if you had to do it over, this, by the way, is the take-home message, if you had to do it over, what would you have done differently? Often you'll hear this answer, I never would have had that surgery. Wow. Listen carefully to those sorts of answers. If you don't ask them, you will not hear it. The second thing is, gee, I wish I'd bought extra canned soup because it hurt like heck to go to the, to the store to buy this stuff. Buying food is a terribly important item. If you live alone or if you live with somebody who's an invalid, having extra food in the freezer and in the pantry is essential. But then come the fun things. What about the costs, the things that you don't see coming down the line? Well, you're going to go in the hospital, and God help you if you have to spend the night. Why? Because the hospitals these days are doing something very interesting. You're going to get about 15 consults from every discipline that you've ever possibly heard of. If you watch TV medical shows, you're finally going to see that there's somebody out there that has that kind of title. These people are going to come in, spend minimal, if any, time with you, write a consult, and bill you for it because that's how the hospitals jack up their fees. So you may go in for a 45-minute surgery, and you'll be shocked at the bill which could get you know be upwards of thirty thousand dollars, okay. The, but the real joke here is the hospitals don't get the thirty thousand bucks. They may only get three thousand for the forty-five minutes you're in the operating room and the hour you're in, you're in recovery. They're still making out like bandits, okay. So you need to understand how to look at your bill and ask the following questions: One, was that me? Okay, because you'd be shocked at, at the stuff that gets thrown on your bill without looking. It's like going to a restaurant on steroids. Okay, if you don't look at your bill in a restaurant, okay, you get you get taken advantage of, right? So the first thing you do is you look at the bill for the, all four line items then there that are on your bill. Do you know how many people don't look at their hospital bills? Oh, God. Okay, there may be three or four hundred lines there. Nobody even asks about it. Well, the fact is that there's an awful lot of fraud on, uh, being undertaken in those bills. Okay, do I believe that to be the case? Absolutely, because they never commit these errors in your favor. That's a statistical improbability. An error is going to go one way or the other, but they never err in your favor. There's always stuff on there that you have no clue about. But the thing that really kills me are the consults. And the only reason I'm mentioning this, okay, and this is the take-home message number two, is that at the end of the game, they're going to tell you, oh, well, your family doctor is going to take care of you when this is done, but they can't get your records. So you need to make plans before you go in to make sure that your attending physician, the surgeon, okay, the person that's in charge of everything, gives you the word of honor that you are going to get the operative note, the admission note, and copies of all the consultations. The surgeon will probably go, yeah, I'll take care of it. it inevitably, it will not get done, and you are going to have to go camp out with your co-payment check in the billing office at the hospital and say, this will get signed when you give me copies of my records to take to the doctors that are supposed to take care of me. Because if I had a nickel for every patient that came out of the hospital without records being sent, Okay, I would be well retired by now. And the fact is they come in and they go, well, gee, they said you would take care of these medicines. And I'm looking at their record and there's nothing there. And we can't get anything from the hospitals. Why? Because they want their dollar a page in order to transfer your care to your family doc, who, by the way, is entitled to those records for free. Okay, so anytime that somebody comes around with a little red bucket saying, hey, give to your local hospital, I want you to remember that A, they have more money than you do, and they're the furthest thing from a charity these days that I have ever seen. Don't believe it. Read the newspaper because they're getting hammered right about now. Now, what about the times when we hear about people that are very, very addicted to elective surgery? You hear about that, that they just, once they have this done to themselves, they want everything done. Oh, oh yeah, it's a, it's a type of Munchausen syndrome. Okay, what is that? You come up with diseases and disease states for which you get medical attention. You know, Munchausen by proxy is where you make somebody else sick, so you get attention. They're both illnesses. The second one is a little bit more serious, in my opinion. I've seen a few of them over the years. But then there's also something called body dysmorphic syndrome. And that's very, very popular as a disease in the state of Florida. And that's where the gals and guys, you know, these days go in for repetitive plastic surgery 
Now, they have shows on television now, these reality shows, showing these people that look like clowns. And, the, and this is generally what happens after they go in and get repetitive surgery by uh, bad surgeons. And there are many of them. Okay, it's just the way it is these days, especially here in the sun state. So what do you do? Okay, there are people that, gee, I've got a little little pimple on my shoulder. Can you please excise it? Never a good idea. There are no easy anesthetics. There are no simple anesthetics. And there's, there is, in fact, there is, in fact, a finite risk of death every time you go in the hospital. So nothing is worse, as happened to my dad, to go in a hospital okay, healthy, and come out with MRSA and die from it, okay? You don't want to be going there unnecessarily. Think through uh, the many possibilities. Gee, it might get a little bit better. Gee, it might get a little bit worse. Gee, it might stay the same. And it's even odds for most surgeries. But there is one place that I love to go to, not the hospital, but I love going to the stages of life, even when I don't have to. (laughs) Well, it's always fun to stop in and visit. Our phone number is 407 679-3337, and our website is stagesoflife.net. We're located in Longwood at 1917 Booth Circle. That's right off of I-4 and 434, just one block east off of Raymond Avenue. Our office hours and health store hours are Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5, and we're also on Facebook at Stages of Life Medical Institute. Life Medical Institute. 